Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pauline Woods Orson, and welcome to another Morris Federation online event. And uh, today we also have Fee Locke and Jerry West helping to host. And uh, our speaker today is Peter Barron on coconut dancing more than just a Lancashire tradition. So handing straight over to Peter. Well, hello there, everybody. Um, so this uh, talk represents my findings to date. It's uh, up to others to interpret what I give you. Uh, I'll not be discussing any issues around the use of blackface. Uh, so please don't ask any questions on that subject. So I'll start off with the uh, Britannia dancers. Uh, probably the most well-known ones to you. Uh, they own the extant tradition in Lancashire. Um, they traditionally perform on the Saturday of Easter weekend and they undertake a perambulation of the town starting at nine o'clock in the morning and finishing up seven o'clock at night. And on their day, they mainly dance to a silver band, but at other times they also dance to concertinas. And in addition to performing the coconut dancers, they also have some garland figures as well. So um, I need to share the screen first, don't I? So uh, we'll do the old sh sh share screen bit. Uh, where's it gone? So, here we go with the Britannia. of you here have either seen them live or videos of them. Uh, what few of you have seen are Els Moritons who dance in Manicor, which is the second largest town in Mallorca. And this group consists of boys of approximately 12 years old and they dance on the Festas de San Domingo, which used to be straightforward, it was the 4th of August. However, a few years back they decided everyone went on holiday on the 4th of August, they all went to the beach. So uh, they, they moved it to May and there is no set date in May as we found out when we booked our holidays to go there. Um, uh, we'd, had the we'd had the date from the organisation, we had the date from the tourist board and about two weeks before we went we found out they'd moved the date to, uh, to af uh, after we'd actually left Mallorca. Luckily they did perform at the opening of the Festas de San Domingo. I do apologise for my foreign accents. I have to do some Spanish in this and lots of French and my, my, my accents are appalling. Um, anyway, um, luckily they, they did dance at the opening ceremony on the, on the Tuesday, so I did get some video of them. But on their day, they dance on Friday and Saturday and they're accompanied by giants and a strange char character called Sally Corn, who you'll see in this video at the beginning. He, he, he sits in a big um, wheelchair thing and caparots, which are the big heads. 
Um, so here we go with that Els Moritons. That was the first two figures. I think they've got six, possibly seven figures, but the first two were, in inverted commas, the traditional figures. The others uh, were sort of entered the repertoire after the 1960s. Anyway, this whole, my, my whole sort of uh, project here on, on coconut dancing started when I realised that tune we've just been listening to bore a resemblance to the uh, what's known as the Rochdale Coconut Dance tune. Um, uh, and just in case you don't know that, most people do know the tune. Um, uh, there's a recording of me playing for a, a, a Morris practice tape uh, for the Run with Morris. <laughs> It tones of Jeff shouting over the top. So back to the uh, Britannia and uh, Els Moritons. If we look at the uh, costume they wear, there are certain similarities. In fact, quite a lot of similarities. Uh, they're both wearing breeches. They've both got a skirt or a kilt over the top of it. I think they both refer to their headwear as turbans. Although the Moritons doesn't really look like that one. Actually, neither does the Britannia really. Um, but they refer to them as turbans. And, of course, most importantly, they've got wooden blocks on their knees, on their hands, and on their waist. Um, the Moritons one, waistband one, is worn centrally and is quite a lot larger. And there have been various theories um, about the history of the Moritons. One of which, it was a war dance inspired by the old customs of the Arabs. An old Spanish soldier is said to have witnessed a nearly identical dance in a Moroccan camp performed to celebrate victory after a battle. And there's various ones like that if you, if you hunt around for it, but there's actually no documentation for them before the 19th century. Uh, and the current organisers 
believe the dance was created by Dominican father P.L. Caldense in 1854. And it was created to heighten the papal dogma of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Not sure how that works, but that's what they say. But it begs the question, where did Father P.L. Caldente actually get the idea for the dance from? And the earliest actual reference I found from appearing in public um, is 1886, when they appeared with giants, uh, along with Cossier musicians and other dancers. Cossier are like, a bit like our Morris dancers, the way Pankies. Uh, and they do go back earlier. They're, they're, they're shown as being much earlier in the 1800s, going out with the giants. Uh, and on the Brit looking at Britannia, on, on their uh, website, which they've updated since I did this talk originally and produced the paper, um, it now says, Our history is one based on oral testimony handed down over 150 years. A popular story is firmly held that the dance and the costume were brought to Rossendale Valley by Cornish tin miners after their industry depleted. The Cornish miners took their skills to many parts of the world and came to nearby Whitworth quarries. Mining stone and coal at the turn of the 19th century was the largest industry in this part of Lancashire, with over 3,000 men and boys involved at its peak. The migrating tin miners who settled in the area are thought to have taught the dances in Rottenstall and Whitworth, including an original Tunstead Mill group. And then they go on to say, the early references to Moorish pirate dance, recorded by one town leader Arthur Bracewell in 1948, has frequently been seen as just a fanciful description by the creator of the dance, but recently found correspondence from these originators reveal a surprising knowledge of Cornish history. An element of English history untaught at school, it seems, but familiar to these individuals, reference to Moorish marauders who for centuries searched the Cornish coastline and sees people as slaves. Descriptions of the kilts and turbans all relate to the Moorish pirates and their dance of mad revelry, which certainly sums up the extravagant activity of our dancers. And just looking at uh, Arthur Bracewell for a minute, I came across a, a report um, after Britannia had danced uh, at the Luther Greenwood Memorial Festival in Cone in the Barlick and Airby Times in 1950 and following their performance the, the paper uh, regurgitated, um, regurgitated a, an article from a, another journal uh, in which Arthur Bracewell said it was in existence in the days of feudalism in our district when they used to dance in front of the rush bearing carts and in front of the troop was one dance with a long whip whose object it was to drive all the devils away. Although in later years, he's used to keep the roads clear for traffic as we dance through the streets at Easter. He goes on to say, when the dance first came to the district, it was brought by two old sailors and is supposed to be a black pirate dance of mad revelry. I am inclined to lean on this belief personally as the kilt or pirate's apron of frigate days and short knee breeches, white stockings and colored turbans seem to take one back to the sea. The dance has been in existence here for 200 years or more, with the present troupe being formed 25 years ago. So notice in, in his earlier description, there's no mention of miners at all, but rather sailors. And his description doesn't really bear up to scrutiny. Uh, as we'll see shortly, the dance is likely to start in 1857. So not 200 years before, which would from 1950 would take to 1750. But even if the 200 years are true, it's not feudal times, which ends about 100 years before that. And the, if you look at the popular story of tin miners, that doesn't really hold up to scrutiny either, because it's true there are a lot of settlers in the area from Cornwall. But from census records, it's conceded that they didn't arrive until after 1861. And there's no families in Witteth in the 1851, 1861 or 1871 census records shown as originating in Cornwall. Now Theresa Buckland, who is with us today, has written a number of articles on the tradition and prior to the Britannia team, the longest living team of nutters in the area were the Tunstead Mill Nutters and they passed their dances on to uh, the Britannia dancers in the 1920s. But I think the first mention of a date for the formation of the Tunstead Mill Nutters 
was when they celebrated their 50th Jubilee in 1907. If that's not correct, uh, please put it in the chat and we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, but yeah, when they did the 50th Jubilee in 1907, um, so obviously 1857, uh, and that, that date then gets repeated in subsequent years newspaper reports. So it would appear that they were formed in 1857 before the migration of families from Cornwall into the area. And additionally, the main trade for the immigrants from Cornwall uh, wasn't in mining, it was in the textile industry. And Theresa says that the first newspaper reports mentioning Eastertide dancing are in 1882. I've actually failed to find that reference myself, but I'll believe her. Uh, but um, for dancing at a different time of year, uh, at the wakes, uh, there's this uh, report in the Rochdale Observer from September 1860. So this is only three years after Tunstad Mill uh, should have been formed. The rush cart, which from time immemorial has graced or disgraced the scene, was this time given up owing, among other causes we think, to the growing intelligence of the inhabitants. A feeble attempt as to keep up the boorish custom was made by the youth of Shawfoot and results in the construction of a rush cart there, but so uncouth an object that we do not apprehend its reproduction. A fantastic piece of timber framework clothed with heather, slightly ornamented, and mounted on a cart was drawn about bridge mill, etc. Accompanied by a number of his young men in grotesque attire as dancers, a portion of whom were begrimed all over with some dark compound and bedixened out in some red trappings for the purpose of mimicking the antics of South Sea cannibals in a coconut dance, a parody forsooth upon their own intellectual progress. I think we ought to use bedixened all the time in everyday language. Now, in 1997, Roy Judge wrote an article for the Folk Music Journal in which he said that he believed that the coconut dance derived in some way from the kind of stage performance given by the Chirini family. Now that might seem a bit unlikely at first glance, but the Chirini family were a very popular entertainment group on the stage in the 19th century. And the following extract from the Halifax Guardian in August 1838 shows how the transmission from stage dance to street dance might have occurred, and thanks to Calderdale Libraries for allowing me to use this. The Chirini family, in their admirable coconut dance, will elicit applause. This dance has now, we believe, been performed four weeks, and it appears like to run another four weeks. Mr Ryan, by the aid of the Chirinis, has made a decided hit in this dance. At every street corner in Halifax, and in every by lane in the country, young men and children may be observed imitating the grotesque features of the coconut ballet. And it is ten to one that out of twenty lads that you meet whistling in the town, nineteen have the coconut tune in their mouths. So that's Britannia and Els Moritons. There's a third tradition of coconut dances in Provence. It's called Le Coco. Uh, and in Provencal dialect is L-E-I-C-O-C-O-T. And all the current exponents of this appear to be folkloric dance groups. And the latest reference I found to uh, an original inverted commas dance appearing is uh, 1913, but I'll come on to that later. And Monique de Citra included Le Coco in her Dance of France, Volume 2, published in 1951. And in that, the dance is published in great detail, but it's unclear whether the figures are uh, from the 19th century or a product, product of the revival. But the earliest reference seems to be in 1864 in Lou Tambran by Frederick Vidal. Now, Tambran is a type of long drum, uh, and the book is split into three parts. The first two concern the history and playing of the instrument, and then the fourth part, sorry, third part, um, is devoted to the national airs of Provence, and this is the one, the page for Lake Oco, and under 
under each tune it gives a brief description of the dance um, and it's in Provençal dialect so with a bit of help from other people we translated this um, and it roughly translates as eight ten or sixteen dancers wearing white breeches coloured shirts with their faces disguised each having eight coconuts fix the knees breasts hands and also the elbows go forward to their partner and back and cross over in all directions and dance gaily to this tune which they accompany in rhythm by hitting their instruments against each other or even against those of the dancers they meet whether they are opposite or alongside i was told by an old witness that not more than 50 years ago one named cure from aix-en-provence then a dancer at the theatre in Lyon taught the chorus of our theatre the ballet Paul et Virginie and that the steps which the pretend moors of Provence have executed very gracefully ever since will be nothing more than the dance of the Negroes performed in this ballet whoever doesn't believe it should see for themselves uh, and there is a cure listed in Marseille in a theatre troupe in 1838 and also Monsieur Cure as part of the management of the Algiers Theatre in 1846 who died in 1847 whether they're the same person whether they're this curé I, I don't know and then there's a couple of publications which cover dances of the area there's the Statistique du Département de Bouche de Ron which was published in 1826 and there's a section devoted to the customs and dance of the area and most of the dances included in Lou Tambran appear in that publication but Le Coco doesn't and then earlier than that there was a, a German traveller Christian Augustus Fischer um, produced a book um, of his travels to Eyar and that again references uh, dances in the area uh, and an English translation for that came out in 1806 and the other dances again are mentioned but not Le Coco so there's, a, there's an implication there uh, that Le Coco probably didn't exist before 1826 although I appreciate the absence of a reference doesn't mean it wasn't there um, but together with um, the theatre reference in, in Lou Tambran there appears there might be a similar pattern between that and the Rossendale dance um, and I'll be returning to Le Coco later in this talk but uh, I'm sure you all want to see what sort of dance they actually do so this is a, a team dancing at um, a carnival in Saint Tropez. <laughs> who ends up in front of the video camera right moving on to the uh, 19th century stage the earliest reference I found to the coconut dance being performed on the stage is 1824 uh, this advert in for Davis's Royal Amphitheatre Westminster Bridge London 
and the entertainment included a representation of the Battle of Waterloo and an equestrian ballet called the Carnival of Venice and to conclude with a new entertainment by Mr Barrymore called Agamemnon with uh, the Faithful Negro in the course of which a grand ballet and coconut dance and although the Battle of Waterloo ran for many weeks Agamemnon with its associated coconut dance ran for only approximately three weeks but by February the following year the Theatre Royal in Manchester was advertising the last week of the Battle of Waterloo together with a production of Slaves Revenge this had a much larger billing as this advert for the Manchester Mercury shows the last week of Waterloo and second night of a new piece called the Slaves Revenge in the course of the piece will be introduced the celebrated coconut dance and in the same month February 1825 in Liverpool at the Olympic Circus a grand coconut dance is included in a production depicting Captain Cook's second voyage to the Sandwich Islands and the coconut dance or pas de coco then appears regularly in advertisements and reviews throughout the rest of the 19th century and all over the country and during the 1830s the dance is often called Shawa Shu and crops up in productions of the melodrama Mungo Park often in a circus environment but also in theatre productions and in pantomimes uh, and I like this one the Chinese pagodas or men powered on men at the end I presume it's a bit like uh, the Catalan um, Castellas or whatever they're called yes where they can anyway there are also many performers doing the dance the coconut dance uh, including the Dali family the four Kafirs, the Ethiopian brothers the Ricardo family but it's the Chirini family that gets the highest billing throughout the 1840s and the dance is also often performed by the corps de ballet or juvenile groups and it wasn't always a group dance some performers specialized in a solo version this is a poster for Jim Brown and his talented son performing in West Hartlepool in April 1865 and later in the month they were appearing in Ashton under Lyne billed as the original double tambourine performers and Jim Brown was from Stockport and advertised his services fairly regularly in the late 1850s and 1860s and in one 1860 advert it says Jim Brown banjo bones tambourine and coconut player and his son will be at liberty on Monday the April 2nd when he'll be glad to hear from proprietors of music halls Mrs Brown pianist and harmonist will also be at liberty he was living in Staley Bridge at the time when he wrote that advert so it seems likely it was a family affair and they touted their acts to whatever production would have them so in in general the coconut dance appears to be very much a novelty dance a novelty act, act that was shoehorned into all sorts of productions and depending on the production the setting of the dance's supposed origins varies from the West Indies to Africa to India to China the South Seas and by 1870s the dance is often referred to as the old coconut dance and by the 1890s it's become firmly established in the repertoire of minstrel groups particularly as part of a sketch called Granny's Birthday but one reference that might be of particular importance in tying it into the stage production productions with Le Coco um, is this extract from a review in October 1870 of the London Amusements for the Olympic the Olympic program has been varied by the production of a new extravaganza called Paul and Virginia borrowing however nothing from the original story but the title but the best thing in the extravaganza is a coconut dance performed in faint remembrance as the tune style of the original one introduced at the Strand Theatre 30 years since by the Chirini family and another review of the same piece says uh, dancing to the well-known tune with a coconut accompaniment and the original Paul and Virginia was a popular piece on the stage in Britain from the late 18th century onwards and it was variously described as an opera a musical drama a musical farce or ballet and it started life as a French story Paul et Virginie set in Mauritius and first published in 1788 and there were 
uh, an English translation had appeared by 1798. And in May 1803, the following advert appeared in the Manchester Mercury for a production of a comedy called Wild Oats, which concluded with the admired musical piece of Paul and Virginia, a characteristic dance by four Indians and symbol dance in the character of a Negro by Mr. Mills. So is that characteristic dance by four Indians a, a, for, a possible forerunner of the coconut dance on the stage that appears 20 years later? And that's where my original presentation finished as far as the 19th century stage goes, but I've been looking a bit more at the French theatre. So I've already mentioned Paul and Virginia and Paul et Virginie. Um, uh, and in France it's also presented as a comedy opera, sometimes a comedy ballet throughout the 19th century. And there were many different scores written for it. The first was by Rodolphe Kreitzer in 1791, but I don't think that had any dancing attached to it. And then Joseph Mazzagini did a score before 1800, and again I'm not sure there's any dancing. But in 1800, Joseph Mazzagini then collaborated with William Reeve on an English version in 1800. And at the end of the first act, there's three acts, it's usually in three acts this. Um, at the end of the first act, there is a Negro dance and march, music by William Reeve. And that music has certain similarities with the, with the coconut dance tunes. And I'll look at this later. And then there's various scores throughout the 19th century. Uh, I've been unable to locate many of them. But I have located the, located the text for quite a few. So it appears that uh, there is usually a dance at the end of the first act, uh, usually called La Bamboula or Bamboule, which I think should means bamboo in French. And it seems to start life as a simple dance where Paul and Virginia copy the natives dancing it with no coconuts. So this may well have been that characteristic dance by four Indians dancing in 1803 in Manchester. I say, and, and in that slot, it, it, there's a dance carries on, and uh, at one point there's a Spanish version in 1862, which has a tango in that place, um, and that has the natives doing a dance followed by or orangutans watching them from behind the trees and then copying them. Um, so it generally seems to have been a humorous dance that appeared at that slot in the in Paul and Virginia, and we already know from the. Le Coco reference that a coconut dance was allegedly danced on the stage in Aix-en-Provence sometime before 1864, supposedly 50 years before, in a production of Paul et Virginie. So then jumping ahead, a long way to 1876, there's a score by Victor Massé. Uh, and this is the little bit that inc uh, from part of Bamboula. And you'll see actually in, in the uh, text is written the slaves dance and hit their coconuts one against the other. And there's also a handwritten manuscript written later in the century for six dances that were all choreographed by Henri Justement. And that among the six dances, one of them is for performing La Bamboula in November 1876 at the National Lyrique Theatre in Paris, so it's probably for this score. That's La Bamboula. So nice little diagrams and and honing in on the important bit. There's um, nine sections in this dance, and this is section nine or part of section nine. Uh, and it, it roughly translates as the mother tresses face to face all starting on the right foot do each step once as in section one while hitting the coconuts in their left hands together then those in their right hands the men face to face the same step while clashing pieces of bamboo the women change places while doing throws and clashing the coconuts with each hand not sure what throws means I can take a guess but uh, and then that movement gets repeated several times during the dance. So it clearly shows that coconuts were being clashed together uh, as part of that dance. Although there's actually no mention anywhere in, in, in the text of them actually being worn. 
Uh, and Massey's music doesn't bear any resemblance to uh, any of the other coconut tunes we know of. And it wasn't only in England and France that Paul and Virginia was performed. In Italy as Paolo e Virginia and Sp Spain as Pablo e Virginia. And often with the same composers as in France, but also sometimes with other composers. But it wasn't just in Paul et Virginie that a coconut dance was performed in France, as in England there were many references to musical acts, including the Chirinis. And it should be pointed out, Monsieur Chirini was in fact Spanish. Uh, in 1848, the Chirinis performed the Pas de Coco at the Chalet on the Champs Elysees, and 1853 in the Hippodrome. And earlier in 1840, so, uh, an unnamed group performed Pas de Coco at the Gymnase des Enfants, Gymnase des Enfants, an entertainment venue in Paris. And there was a novel produced in 1854, La Bucutier du Chateau d'Eau by Chevalier Paul de Kock. Uh, one, one bit says, the latter turns around when he hears laughter and seeing the young boy begins to laugh too. Then with the cane, he does a few steps of a bizarre dance that recalls the famous Pas de Coco, danced in all the melodramas where Negroes feature. Which shows that by 1854, the dance was widely spread in melodramas on the stage. And in 1872, the Folie Berger Music Hall in Paris had the celebrated Hanlon family, a review which included, then the trio of juveniles go through the famous old coconut dance. And in January 1886, at La Fada La Loire, that's very hard to say that, Le Cirque Pledge presented a pantomime with La Danse de Coco, Ballet Comique pour tous les jeunes artistes. And La Cirque Pledge was still including a coconut dance in its programme at Troyes in 1901. La Danse de Coco, a miniature ballet performed by about 15 children aged between 3 and 14, was well applauded. And there was a Monsieur Pledge, presumably an earlier generation, performing on the stage with the Chirini family in Halifax at the 1838 uh, performance where I read out before where it went out onto the, or may have gone out onto the streets. So altogether a very similar pattern in France um, to the English stage of the time and I'm sure if I look further into Italy and Spain and other countries I'd find similar reports. So going back to Le Coco saw the video earlier. There was a Provençal cultural organisation set up in 1854, La Felle Brige, and they promoted all things Provençal. And they put on fets which included Provençal dances. And in 1887, in a Grand Fete Provençal, two societies from Arles put on the Arlesian Farandol figures in the middle of the reconstruction of the Buffet Coco Olivet, Chevaux Frisque, these dances are presented as the distractions of our fathers today, almost forgotten, resurrected for a day. So Buffet Olivet, which are being performed with the cocoa, are other ones which are, are in the earlier references before uh, cocoa comes along. And eight years later, in 1895, uh, the local paper Petit Marseillaise published an article covering a fête provençale in the small village of Aubaine. Um, this covered a number of uh, dances, one of which was Lake Coco, and it was the second dance in the sequence, and they refer to the dances as games. So our best translation of this, or Alison's best translation of this. The second of these games is the coconut dance. This entertainment has an, old, has an origin as old as the game of the castanets, whose first cousin it is. The Moors and Saracens kept time in their dances by the sound of suitable pieces of wood on the chest, on the stomach, or on the knees against which the dancers struck in time with small wooden sticks. These primitive instruments gave birth to castanets in Spain. The game of coconuts preserves their primitive, primitive character in Provence, and it is thus that the Committee of Aubaine reconstructed them, in the same way as they had been understood in 1887 by a Provencal scholar, Dr Fanton was done in the festivals that took place at that time in Marseille for the benefit of school funds. The game of coconuts 
is performed by young people arranging a circle around the tambourine. They jump and frolic as they please while setting the pace with the clash of the coconuts. To simulate the swarthy complexion of Africans, the coconut dancers of our fathers smeared their faces and hands with black and wore the traditional costume of a planter, white pants with blue or red stripes, the red or blue tail and the huge straw hat. The Oban coconut dancers have kept the costume but they will not take the love of accuracy so far as to blacken their face and their hands. I'm not quite sure what a tail is but I'm guessing it's the, probably the cummerbund. So it seems that Lake Coco was reinvented in 1887 and then again eight years later in 1995 and then after that it appears as other events put on by the organisation and the last of those I've located was in Aix-en-Provence in 1913. And as I said before, uh, Monique de Cetre then included it in Dances of France in 1951. There's a few references to the coconut dance being performed as a party piece. Um, so about the Leeds Times, this is 1840, this is only two years after that Halifax reference. Uh, grand Concert and Ball. On Monday evening last, Mr. John Ingham held a grand concert and ball in the Old Fellows Hall. The Glee Singers commenced by singing The Smiling Morn. The Grand Coconut Dance was performed by four gentlemen of Halifax. Mr. Bradley danced a sailor's hornpipe in character. And jumping forward to uh, 1908, a report on the Litchfield Bower. Uh, after reporting about the bower procession itself, it covers the sports afterwards. And between each of the sports, there appears to have been uh, musical pieces or, or you know, little pieces. And one of the little pieces was an American sketch, synopsis. A party of darkies steal away from their quarters after nightfall and march to a barn where is introduced a coconut dance. As a quick aside for those interested in Litchfield Morris dances, uh, two troops appeared that year in the procession. procession one from Stafford and the other from the Midland Truant School. And then in uh, 1902, De Derek Schofield put me onto one of these. I think it was the first of the ones, but then I found the other. Might have been the other way around. Anyway, Haslingdon Gazette, March 1902. Under the auspices of the Haslingdon Workmen's Club, the annual knife and fork tea was held on Saturday. An enjoyable programme of dance was rendered. Vocal selections were admirably given. Mr. James Hurry of Haslingdon gave a coconut dance. And then in 1908, in a report on the wedding of Miss Sarah Thompson to Mr. James Dewhurst, after the wedding there was a luncheon. Subsequently, Mr. Charles Rushton took the chair. Mr. George Mitchell opened the programme with a selection Wedding Bells on the gramophone. And other contributors to the programme were Miss Lister of Stacksteads, Mr. E. Hansen of Rottenstall, and Messrs. H. Holden and Jim Hurry, who gave a coconut dance. Unfortunately, James Dewars, the groom, died less than two years later, leaving his wife and only child living with a family in 1911. So, um, quick roundup of other coconut dance groups. We've already mentioned the Tunstead Mill coconut dancers who were the ones who passed their dances on to Britannia in the 1920s. Um, this picture appears on the Stacksteads band page or I think uh, Theresa Buckland had it as a front on the folk music journal as well uh, and they're wearing an extra sash on, the, on, on this on this picture which uh, Obviously it doesn't come out very well on this, but it says uh, a Jubilee or 50th Jubilee or something. Um, so I assume it's a 1907 anniversary. Uh, and there were other teams in the area. There's a, in Cloughfold, there was a team of Co-Kernup dancers, that's C-O-K-E-R. Uh, they appeared in Fallings Park, Rochdale as part of the 1911 coronation celebrations for George V. And Theresa Buckland's identified four of the teams in the area as well. And the Cotton Times, the 3rd of April, 1891, refers to numerous gangs of payseggers, that's spelt P-A-Y-S, payseggers, 
and coconut dancers, a very ancient custom and much in vogue in this civilised district. And it would appear that not all uh, coconut dance groups um, blacked up. This is a picture of an unknown team which was given to Teresa by John Flynn, former leader of the Britannia dancers. And if you look, they're all wearing their, um, their waistband nuts centrally, like the Moritons did. And in July 1910, a carnival was held to celebrate the uh, Diamond Jubilee of the Parish Church in Whitworth to raise funds for a new peal of bells. And there's a picture from those celebrations. Now in Whitworth, the coconut dancers and the garland dancers were separate, unlike in Britannia where they do both dances. You can see the coconut dancers at the front. Again, the, uh, the nut appear in the centre of the belt appears to be central. And that's borne out by research that Julian Pilling published in 1961 he was told they used to uh, they used a larger disc of wood in the middle of the belt holding up the skirt and the next dancer called john waddington who i'll be mentioning shortly also said that the waistband nut should be central and the 1910 event was very much a one-off occasion although the Whitworth church morris dancers did continue for a few years i found no evidence that this revived coconut dance team danced on any other occasion so moving away from Lancashire, a um, couple of references from Derbyshire, one from 1859 in the Derbyshire Advertiser and Journal. So this is only two years after Tunstead Mill uh, are said to have formed and a coconut dance was performed at the Buxton Well Flowering. And the Morris dancers perambulated the usual thoroughfares performing a variety of pleasing and grotesque dances, the most successful being the coconut dance. Unfortunately, we've got no idea what sort of movements might have been involved in that. But we do have some idea about the movements in 1891 in New Mills. A report in the Glossopdale Chronicle of North Derbyshire Reporter, July 1891. And it was the Foresters' Demonstration and Gala at New Mills. Following the Lurries was the New Mills Fife and Drum Band and next the Juvenile Coconut Dancers numbering between a dozen and twenty, all of whom were attired in coloured garments, some with red and other with green hats. And from a different newspaper, Theresa Buckland reports that they danced in two files, halves of coconut shells on each hand and knee were cracked together. Those on the knees clapped with those on the hands twice, followed by those on the hands clapped together twice. So altogether, uh, quite a simple dance. And if head further south still, into North Lee in Oxfordshire, there was a team of Morris dancers in North Lee and uh, they had a coconut dance as part of their repertoire. And Cecil Sharp interviewed William Partlett, in, who was 79 at the time, and he interviewed him in 1910. And he said that the dancers ceased dancing 40 or 50 years earlier, so that means they'd have finished about 1860, 1870. And he also collected from another former dancer a couple of years later in 1912, Fred Gardner, who was 80 and living in Whitney. And he gave Cecil Sharp a description of the coconut dance and he said, only held coconuts in palms of hands and did simple clapping dance. And the tune they used was Mrs. Casey, so not a relative of the various coconut tunes and is a jig rather than a polka. And heading further south again, uh, St Mary Cray, used to be in Kent, is now in the borough of Bromley and thanks to them for allowing me to use the picture. There was a Carnival or May Day festival, some years it appeared in June and some years it appeared in May. Uh, it was held under the auspices of the local paper mill W. Joynson and Sons between 1889 and 1893. And the choreography for the pageant was provided by Mr Valentine of Drury Lane. Uh, and the coconut dancers appeared in 1890 and 1893 and may well have appeared in other years. So the fact it was choreographed by Mr. Valentine of Drury Lane probably means it was a theatrical version of the dance. 
and I couldn't really do a roundup of other coconut dancers without including the wonderful, wonderful Berkshire Bedlams. So this is a film of them dancing in 2019, thanks to Ryan Grayley, I'm not sure if he's on today or not, uh, for allowing me to use this film, but if you are interested in Morris dance videos, Ryan's got uh, loads of Morris footage, just search for him uh, on YouTube. So that was Coconut Spy, Berkshire Bedlam. So, back to the tunes now. I said earlier on, this whole thing started because I realised that there was a similarity between Els Moriton's tune and the tune known as the Rochdale Coconut Dance. And there's a third tune, um, called, just simply called The Coconut Dance. Uh, and it appears in the musical casket, um, or Melodies for the Million. A choice collection of the most favourite popular airs arranged in a pleasing style for the flute, violin, flagellae, cornopean and accordion with semitones. And I found two versions of this. There's a slight difference in one of the bars. Um, this, is, this is the one from an American university. Sorry, library, not university. Um, and another one in Vaughan Williams Memorial Library. The... Um, the American one is uh, catalogued as being 1830s and the Vaughan Williams one is catalogued as being 1843. I believe there might be a similar version in Bodleian Library as well. Um, 1843 does seem the more likely date. Uh, the earliest cornopean known was from 1834 and accordions with semitones were developed in the 1820s into the 1830s. So not, not impossible for it to be 1830s but 1843 is probably more likely. And the other tunes in the uh, musical casket are just popular tunes of the day, so presumably this was a popular tune of its time. And then just quite recently I've come across uh, a French clarinet tutor dated 1876. Um, Les Danses de Coco, Souvenir de la Martinique. And like all tutor, uh, instrument tutors you get all the technical stuff at the beginning and then at the end there's a group of tunes for you to practice and they're usually quite well known tunes so that uh, you can have a, you, you have a you know what you're meant to be playing um 
So I think again we can say in 1876 in France the tune was obviously a well-known tune. Um, the Els Moritons tune, this is the version on their website. Um, and in private correspondence with the group I've been told that the earliest manuscript version of the tune is from the early 20th century. And the tune that everyone calls the Rochdale Coconut Dance was simply called Coconut Dance by Henry Brearley who sent it to uh, Anne Geddes Gilchrist in 1927. Uh, he had mentioned it he wrote something like, something like a memoirs of Rochdale a few years earlier and mentioned it in that but the tune was sent to Anne Gaddis Gilchrist um, and he was in his 80s at the time when he actually sent it to her um, and he said he remembered the coconut dancers and the tune from when he was a lad between 1852 and 1860 so this is him remembering something from his youth and his correspondence with Anne Gilchrist he says that the Rochdale rush carts were generally attended by a band of what they called coconut dancers. He does say he never saw them actually dancing but just standing and beating out the rhythm of the tune. However he continues, perhaps I ought to say I only remember them thus, for as they must have accompanied the rush carts, some job of dancing or prancing with the cart drawers seems inevitable. And in my previous presentation and in the paper that went with it, I said that when the Whitworth Morris men started dancing in the 1970s, a Mr. Greenwood helped them recreate the Whitworth dances. That turns out not to be true. First, it was John Waddington who was the person who remembered the tune. Um, and it was Dave Cook who was very involved with the Whitworth Morris dancers at the time. Uh, he played the Rochdale tune to John Waddington. And he said, oh, that's a tune Whitworth uh, coconut dancers used to use. Uh, but it shouldn't be played like that. It should be played much more staccato. And also, it should be the minor bit first. Uh, the, um, the version from Henry Brearley starts with the major. And that's a common thing that we're going to see in a minute. All the different versions of this tune, the majors and the minors are always, no one, um, they get messed up which way around they are. And that goes on in sessions today when people start. Sometimes they start on one and sometimes they start on the other. So I've done a, 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 some comparisons here. Um, so this is the musical casket coconut dance versus uh, compared with Els Moritons. In this case, it's just the A music, so both. Um, the Els Moritons goes da 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 da, and the musical casket goes dun da dun da 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 dun da 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 dun pa. And carries on da 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 and the musical casket dun da 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 and then the first part of the of the next line repeats the first bit and then the final bit that it goes adrift by either a semitone or a tone for the fact for the penultimate three bars I'm going to come back to that later. But the main thing is that the uh, the bit more syncopation in the musical casket one, but it's evidently the same tune. And then if we look at the musical casket B music and compare it to the Rochdale Coconut tune from Henry Brearley, you get the Rochdale Coconut goes da 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 ya da 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 dum pa da 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 ya da 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 and the musical cast goes dun da dun da 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 dun da dun da 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 ya da dun da 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 ya da dum pa da it's even closer um there's uh again you've got more syncopation but we've already heard that whitworth the chap who uh helped whitworth out at the beginning he reckoned it should have been more syncopated and if you think henry Brearley was remembering a tune from his youth you know, he could well have smoothed the tune. But in each case, I've shown you two halves of tune, in each case, the other half of the tune, the Rochdale tune and the um, Els Moritons tune, doesn't match the musical casket. 
um, whether they were reaching the harmony lines or, or, or they've taken off on the, on their own or, or what, I don't know. Um, it could be there's a third, another tune out there which they've all come from. The, the Henry Brearley tune does work better as a harmony than, than the uh, Els Moritons. So what about the tune from the uh, the French tutor, clarinet tutor, Les Dances de Coco? That is almost identical apart from, again, that the syncopation is slightly different. But the penultimate three bars, oh, and, and the A's and B's are the other way around as well. <laughs> but the penultimate three bars of that first bit, again, we've got this drift of a semitone or a tone uh, in the ones which are highly in red in yellow there. But that then matches identically with the Els Moritons version. So again, it all ties in together. And I mentioned earlier about uh, Paul and Virginia, uh, the William Reeve tune. And this is uh, an extract of uh, the 1800 tune. And it, it, it's where Bambula was later placed. It doesn't give it, it just calls it celebrating Negro March in this one. And I thought that the first part of this bore a lot of resemblance to other coconut tunes. So I, I did a comparison of Paul, the Paul, Paul and Virginia Negro March to the Rochdale tune and shifted them down so that they started at the same starting note and I shifted it modally. And I thought, I still think there's a lot of similarity there, but I thought my knowledge of tunes isn't good enough for this to, to say whether it's the same tune or, 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 or it's just coincidence. So I asked uh, Elaine Bracke, who works for Vaughan Williams Memorial Library, um, lives in the States. I was hoping she's going to be with us, but I don't think she has joined us. Uh, anyway, she, she had a look at it for me and, and this is what she says. My thoughts. It's not the same tune, but they exhibit several stylistic traits in common. It got me thinking about those musical cliches you hear in theatrical music used to evoke a certain ethnic atmosphere. This may be the case here. I've attached a setting I did, converted the Negro March to 4-4 and doubled the B part of the Rochdale tune. You see some really similar patterns. The repeated motif of four crotchets followed by four quavers and two crotchets. The pattern of upward leaps going into the relative minor in the B part. Some of the rhythmic patterns relates to the choreography, I suspect. And I don't know how similar the choreography is between the two dances, but there may be some overlap there. I can't say they're the same tune, but they seem like the same genre of tune. Much as you'd see similar patterns in a couple of dotted hornpipes, even though they're distinct tunes. And that set me thinking about the Le Coco tune that we saw earlier, because previously I thought there's no connection between that and the other coconut dance tunes. So I've made a slide up which shows the first part of five of the tunes. I've swapped the A's and B's where necessary. And I've not included Dance de Coco as it's so similar to the musical casket one. So I've got musical casket, Els Moritons, Rochdale, Le Coco and the Negro March. And I've shifted uh, the starting notes so they all start on the same so you can see one against the other. And you can see that all five tunes should do show similar characteristics. The second, fourth and eighth bars often have a leap, usually upwards. And most of the other bars are quavers, never moving more than two notes away from the adjacent notes. And the musical casket and Danse de Coco are dotted. But as I said earlier, it's possible that was the case at Whitworth or probably originally the Rochdale one. And if you look at that, then Le Coco does, join, uh, does fit into that pattern. So it could be part of a, of a genre. Um, the second part of the Els Moritons tunes doesn't follow that, but uh, something to think about. So, coming to the end now, summary. This began when I realised that the Rochdale Coconut Dance tune 
was very similar to the tune used by Els Moritons, and there appear to be similarities between all three coconut dance traditions. And it seems like that at least two of the traditions developed from theatrical performance. And it's clear that Rochdale coconut dance and the tune used by Els Moritons come from a common source. This may be the coconut dance published in the musical casket or the, probably another source as only half of each tune matches well. And the William Reeve tune for the Negro March in 1800 has similarities with the other coconut dances, so possible the, there is a genre there. And the Lake Coco tune appears to fit that genre. And coconut dancing was popular on the 19th century stage in England and France, and it was definitely used in some productions of Paul et Virginie. And I haven't mentioned them, but there are references to coconut dancing on stage, on stage in New Zealand and the USA. So that's an all good bits of research. There's obviously areas that still need doing. I haven't had a lot of luck on finding online references for Spanish and Mallorcan archives and newspapers, at least not ones I can get it for free. Um, so it would be really nice if we could find any references to, to Father P.L. Caldente starting the Moritons, or at least some references which predated 1886 uh, for the Moritons. And the, an ex-member of Bakeup told me, sorry, I should say Britannia, shouldn't I, has told me of a mosaic in, I can't say this, Frigiliana, apparently some tourist destination in south of Spain. Uh, it's, uh, this mosaic, it says, shows a garland dance addressed just like Britannia. I did write to the tourist board but got no response whatsoever. And then in the Philippines, there is another coconut dance tradition called the Maglalactic. Um, and that was collected by Francis Reyes Aquino in the late 1920s and published in Philippine folk dances, but that was a long time later, in 1950s I think, after the Second World War. And it's supposed to represent a fight between Moors and Christians. And unfortunately it's become part of a, a, a national dance, um, you know, a whole load of dance have been put together and it, I, I suspect it bears little resemblance to what was collected, but it's definitely worth going on uh, hunting for Magalactic and, and, and looking for the YouTube videos of it, the fact it's fantastic. But it'd be really nice to find what the original field notes were, but uh, I understand they were, they were lost during World War II. Uh, originally it didn't have a tune, and by the time it gets published in the Philippine folk dances, it's got a tune which they all use. It'd be interesting to find some, try and find some more of the 19th century scores for Paul and Virginia or Paul et Virginie, and see if uh, there is any tune there which is a bit closer to the coconut dance tune that we know. And very, very finally, there's an Italian tune called Gran Contradanza that uh, appears in uh, the 1890s in a, in a tune book of Northern Italian dance tunes. Um, and I think the A music bears a remarkable similarity to the tune that the uh, Britannia dancers use now. It goes, dum bum ba ba da ba dum bum ba ba da ba dum ba ba da ba da ba di da dum ba ba dum ba ya da 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 dum ba da da yum pom 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 then the B music goes off entirely on a different tune but there we are I'm going to finish at that and I shall stop sharing the screen.